We have two inspiring interviews today. It's Tuesday, May 30th. I'm senior writer Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. On this podcast, we have spoken to people like Jay Williams and Ryan Shazier, who saw promising careers ended very suddenly by severe injuries. But there are people out there who suffer even more drastic injuries than that, but continue to defy limits that people, even their own doctors, put on them. Today, we're going to hear from two of those people. Both are veterans. Both have had to deal with things that are hard for most of us to truly understand. They both give back to their communities in very different ways. And both are hockey players who continue to compete at a high level. I'm very excited to bring you each of these conversations. The first is with three-time gold medal winner for the U.S. Paralympic sled hockey team, Jen Lee. All right. I'm now very excited to be joined by Jen Lee. Jen is the goalie of the U.S. Paralympic sled hockey team. Welcome, Jen. Hey, thank you, Owen. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, you are you're a three-time gold medalist, one-time silver. Uh, and But before all that, you were injured in a motorcycle accident in 2009. You had your left leg amputated. When did you realize you could still be an athlete competing at a high level despite your injury? Yeah, uh, it's really... After my motorcycle accident, I was still in the military in the service at that time. Back, that was back in March 2009. And, you know, first thing was, can I even walk again, walk, run again, all that good stuff? But I couldn't. So it was really until I got transferred to a rehabilitation rehab center uh, here in San Antonio, Texas, called Center for the Intrepid to rehab, you know, military wounded service members, injured service members, you name it. Uh, that really kind of gave me a different outlet and perspective looks. Uh, just because these guys were pretty much combat wounded and gave me a lot of motivation to not make excuses about about myself. And there was a lot of, uh, throughout the rehab program, adaptive sports was introduced. So there was different types of sports throughout. And that kind of gave me a really spark of understanding that, hey, maybe I can continue to be competitive and be an athlete and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what did you have to learn to do, relearn to do through that recovery process? Yeah, I think uh, physically wise, you got to learn how to walk again, you know, like the walk, run, uh, the walk, run face, you know, in that in that in that perspective. Uh, for me, it was, you know, what, what, you know, wearing a prosthetic was something that's never you know new to anyone who has been an amputee. So myself included. So, you know, for me, that definitely was very, very hard, very tough just to learn how to walk again, knowing that, hey, you, you know how to do this for the last 22 years of your life. Now you got to do it all over again. And, Running again, it's a totally different mentality, totally different concept. Uh, then, you know, learning the adaptive sports side where you think as an able body, you can play the sports that you, you do in a wheelchair, but it's totally not, totally different concept, totally different mechanics. And those things are, are definitely um, something that you had to learn from scratch from day one. Yeah. And so your accident was in 2009. You won a gold medal in 2011. That is a very fast turnaround. Um, what was it like? Did you have like a very intense regime getting back into shape? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I believe you when you say you win gold medal in 2011, that's probably one of like the first competitive small gold medal uh, on the national team. Um, but I think just being on the national team, once I was selected on the team in 2011 for the first time after being injured and all that, I think those, those are different definitely a type of feeling that you never thought you could be at a high competitive level, uh, especially that, you know, you just, you were just doing it for therapeutic reasons and uh, Paralympics and everything else, adaptive sports and everything else was very brand new to me. Uh, I had no idea what it was. I had to, you know, look up the difference between Paralympics and different types of, uh, you know, adaptive sports and different things out there. Yeah. And actually, if you could give us uh, just a sense of the, the different, options and and sports out there um f- uh, for that that community yeah totally so you know uh, there's different types of that sports i just kind of mentioned earlier i know i keep saying that sports but you know wheelchair basketball was something that i tried first then there's actually a pair of golfing or amputee golfing uh, you actually can play that in a in a uh, adaptive adaptive uh, power chair as well uh, there's there was CrossFit that was coming up back in 2011 and on, and now there's adaptive CrossFit division two in the CrossFit Games. Uh, there's different, you know, there's running, track and field. I I, I ran anywhere between you know 5K half marathon to a full marathon. Uh, you know, there's wheelchair rugby, wheelchair football, wheelchair softball, and then 
course, there's para ice hockey or sled hockey, we call it in the U.S. So uh, there's a lot of different adaptive sports out there, and you name it, and then it just uh, you got to go out there and try if you've ever never been, even if you're able-bodied. And you also work with other amputee patients. Could you tell me about your work there? Yes. Uh, so I I was a outreach director for a company called Therapy. Therapy was specifically focused on phantom and neuropath- neuropathic pain uh, or nerve pain. Phantom pain, I'm not sure if you ever heard of it or anything like that. It's almost like your, you know, your foot or your hand or whatever your traumatic amputation limb was uh, that your brain is telling is still there. So long story short, uh, I had myself was struggle, struggle with phantom pain, limb pain for the longest time. And until I got um, connected with Therapy and Therapy had this device, it's a vibrating device that kind of helped you alternate that pain signal from your brain to your to residual limb, you know, till so, uh, that cell that that helped me a lot, especially you know with my sleeps and and different things and sports performance too is a huge thing. So long story short, I realized that when if this device kind of helped me, I knew I was gonna able to help other amputees like myself who are experiencing this pain. And uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of amputees out there who have a lot of issues with this type of pain. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sure. And it's something that I, I'm guessing that you never you're never fully done with it, right? You but you can learn to manage it. You can learn techniques and devices, perhaps therapies that, that help you get through each day. Yeah. You said it right. I mean, you know, it's, it's something that you have to go work on for the rest of your life. It's not a cure. This device is definitely not a cure. It can help you manage your pain and definitely decrease your pain level. So I say, if I wake up today, you know, with a nine, a pain level of nine, it can, the brain device can help me to decrease the pain level to a six or five, even though, it's still the pain is still there. It has, you know, it's a huge difference when being at a nine for the day. And, you know, I think those things are uh, very important. And like you said, it's just one of those things that, you know, it's a, you know, like last week when I was in Colorado and there's been thunderstorm, you know, the lightning somehow thunderstorm in my body has this weird connection. And I was just getting all these crazy nerve pain striking through my limb. Yeah. Oh, um, just to, to wrap us up here, is there anything else that, that you want to add on, on anything we talked about? Yeah, co- co- totally. You know, I think, uh, you know, we at points, you know, Paralympic sports, adaptive athletes and adaptive sports in general, we're at a very good point uh, where, you know, there are getting a little bit more recognitions and awareness throughout the countries, uh, a little bit worldwide, but the work is still not done. You know, there's still a lot of uh, different teams out there and different players uh, who does not get the recognitions, uh, whether or not they putting their hard work and soul and sweat out there 24 seven, you know, and sometimes the, the feedback of it is just like, oh, you guys are just, uh, you know, still adaptive athletes or disabled athletes and we don't care about. Uh, that's not true at all. I think there's always ways where we can provide that and share the light. And people always see that as a may, maybe a way to say, oh, can we make money out of this or not? But at the same time, it's like, how would you know if you don't try to, you know, give it a try, give it a shot, you know, and uh, pretty much uh, that's, that's the cross message that I get. I'm just trying to get that and spread the word. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for coming on. Thank you again uh, for having me. I want to thank City, a uh, proud ambassador of City as well. So for having me and having this show. So you guys are doing great things and keep it up. Up next, I had a fun and inspiring conversation with para-athlete Christy Gardner. I think all of you are going to enjoy this one, but if you're a dog person, she's about to become your new hero. We'll have that conversation right after this. Here's what's trending now. You can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. 33,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. Everything they need to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity. Whether your business generates millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, take advantage of this special financing offer of no payments or interest for six months at netsuite.com slash frontoffice. That's netsuite.com slash front office. All right. Very excited now to be joined by Christy Gardner, para ice hockey player and track and field thrower. Welcome, Christy. Hey, thank you. How's it going today? Going great. So if you could start by telling us your journey that landed you at the U.S. women's para ice hockey team, um, how did all that happen? Sure. I mean, it's kind of a long story, so I'll abbreviate a bit. But I was injured overseas in the Army in 2006. 
And I spent about five and a half years rehabbing through physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, all of that. Um, and eventually went, finally conceded to a friend, a fellow veteran, that I would come to this sporting event with him, even though I knew that I couldn't ever do sports again, according to the doctors. And so I finally gave in. I went with Neil to this winter sports clinic, and it was supposed to be ski and snowboarding for the most part, but they introduced a new sport each evening, like wheelchair basketball, adaptive kayaking, and sled hockey. So I went to the sled hockey clinic. I was on the ice for like 20 minutes, but I absolutely fell in love with the sport. And so the group that ran the clinic agreed to loan me equipment for six months. So I borrowed their gear and I went home and the local high school girls athletes taught me how to play hockey and learned all the rules and all the basics. And I tried out for the U.S. women's team that summer and made the team. Wow. And what was it about sled hockey that connected with you? Honestly, really the team atmosphere and the camaraderie of it going from the military and having your unit and all your battle buddies that have your back and that you work with every day, it really resonated to have a similar representing the U S experience. Yeah. Um, and, and so uh, you, you've won gold with the para ice hockey team. What does it mean for you to compete at that level? It's pretty incredible. I mean, besides the support of people like city and helping elevate the game to an international stage, um, and then just like I said, having that new family of being with the girls all the time. And honestly, the big thing for me was with my career being cut short, uh, I've never done anything to the minimum of my in my life. So I plan to serve in the military and represent the country that way forever until I retired, you know, a good 20, 22 at least years. And unfortunately, I was only able to serve for three and a half. So being on the national team is another way to be able to wear my nation's uniform. Yeah. And so you're also a track and field thrower in, with shot put and discus. Uh, just tell me a bit about that. How'd you get into that? Uh, yeah, I started actually like two months before the Rio trials um, for the Rio Paralympic Games. And I started throwing shot put and discus and javelin back then because I had a background in it from high school and college. And I really kind of, I guess you could say I enjoy it. Um, I just happen to be more good at it. So I've been doing it since then. And since that very first trial, I've been the first in America. Um, and I have the American record for both javelin in my classification and shot put. Mm, wow. Um, do you still hold those records? Uh, I think I do in javelin. I'm not sure. I'm not competing in it right now. But uh, shot put's my primary event. And I was an alternate for the Tokyo Games in it. Para hockey or sled hockey right now is a men's Paralympic sport, not women's right now, but that's um, something that people are working on. So uh, what can you tell us about the quest to make that happen? Yeah, I mean, it's been a dream since I joined the national team, uh, especially of our, our captains and stuff, really aiming to bring our sport to that level and, and to that stage. But with the support of City and last year's world championships, we were able to bring together uh, four squads for the inaugural Women's World Challenge. And in this year, there'll be a fifth team added. Um, and so with their support, we're able to grow the game internationally, you know, around the world, and finally elevate it to having enough teams to make it into the Paralympics. Because it's not just that us in Canada are amazing. We have to find other teams around the world that can you know, fund their way into the games as well. And is there that international community to, to support, you know, a broad international competition in women's sled hockey? Yes and no. Um, through us and Team Canada, we are doing equipment drives and things like that to help outfit the other nations. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone is on the same page with uh, human rights and disability rights like the U.S. and Canada. So I think bringing it up in some of the other nations, especially on the women's side, is a challenge. But with City's help, we are able to support those other programs and bring them in and help them get to a level where their nation can be proud of them and their abilities as well. And is that inevitably a social cause, even if like all you care about is making it a, a women's Paralympic sport? Yeah. Is, is it, do you end up making it a social cause as well? But yeah, we truly do. Um, unfortunately, we've seen other nations and, you know, one group was starting up their program. And like I said, it's hard enough to get equipment because a hockey sled itself is $900. So it's certainly not a cheap sport to learn. But then the other nation, the women said that they were having a hard time recruiting because their own government said that they could only have ice once a month from like two to three in the morning. 
So if you're going to be a rookie and trying to learn this sport, trying to have access as a disabled female is, is a tremendous barrier in some places. So like there, there are rinks and they say you can have, have access to this rink from at 2 a.m. for one hour, one time a month. Wow. Because I, I guess it must be fully booked, you know, midnight to 6 a.m. every other day, apparently. Right. Well, and the priority <laughs> is to support their men's programs to get them the gold medal instead. And so it was kind of crappy that they said, you know, this is your opportunity to recruit brand new players. Sure, you're really going to get up at one in the morning to go try something you've never done before. Wow. Um, on a totally different topic, we were talking before we hit record uh, about um, about dogs. I, I'm thinking about getting a dog at some point, but it's sort of like a, you know, a, a big addition to one's life. You said you have 53 dogs. Um, how does that work? So actually, uh, when I was injured while I was still rehabbing on active duty, they recommended I apply for a service dog. And so I got paired with Moxie, who was this absolutely incredible golden retriever. Uh, she was trained in mobility assistance as well as seizure alert response because I had a brain injury overseas and it, unfortunately I have epilepsy from that now. And so she really changed my life. She was instrumental in helping me get back active and, you know, out of the wheelchair and off the couch and those sorts of things and finding out that I really could push my limits through her assistance. And so since then, I worked with some other agencies and became a puppy raiser for them. And I learned how to be a dog trainer. And then in 2020, when the Paralympics got postponed, we founded Mission Working Dogs. And we train service dogs for mobility assistance and or PTSD and um, therapy dogs for community groups like schools and hospitals and nursing homes. And so we started in 2020 with four dogs and $9,000. And now we've grown to 53 dogs in, in just over three years. And it, it, apparently you also have a, a prison program as well. Yeah. So we're currently in three facilities in the state of Maine where um, individuals who are incarcerated in the state are called residents. And those residents can, through good behavior, earn a dog as their cellmate instead of sharing with another human. And so these men are able to give back to the community um, and try to make amends for what they did by helping train service dogs for those that have disabilities. Huh. Wow. That's fascinating. Are there any misconceptions that you tend to hear about para hockey, para sports in general? Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, because we are folks with disabilities, a lot of people look at us as fragile. And so I think that's one of my favorite things about sled hockey is that it is so physical and so competitive. Even on the women's side, we're full checking. And so you can take a person like myself, I'm missing uh, both legs and a couple of fingers, and I've had a lot of different other fractures and things. And I can go out and chase you down the ice and just absolutely rail you into the boards because it's legal in our sport. And so this misconception that, oh my God, you're disabled, you should stay home, you should be careful, you should use your wheelchair and all these things. And we're kind of like, the heck with that. We're going full speed and hard as we can every day. Yeah. And it sounds like the heck with that is kind of a, uh, a life philosophy for you. A little bit. I mean, not, not as politically correct normally. But I mean, the, the doctors placed so many limits on what they said I was going to be able to do with my life. And so I've basically broken every single one of those barriers. The only thing that I still can't do is actually just wiggle my toes because they don't exist. Yeah, well, very inspiring stuff. Christy Gardner, thanks so much for joining us on the show. No problem. That's it for today. Hope you enjoyed the long weekend. I think we're now allowed to say that summer is here. Let us know what you are thinking of the show on Apple, Google, Spotify, or give me a shout on Twitter. I always love hearing from you. I'm at Owen Poindexter. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey.